Hey everybody, Nightmares Nightly here. This story was written by Tobias Malm. If you enjoy this story, please check out his new novel, The Cave to Another World. A story about a world where humans never evolved. It expands upon what happens in this story that we're about to read. And this just so happens to be one of my favorite stories that I've read in a long time. I'll leave links in the description and the comments down below. Now, without further ado, let's get into it. I came home a year ago. Alex didn't. He was my best friend. The only one I could share everything with. Now I have no one but you. Strangers on the internet. Sometimes it feels like I didn't return from that place either. At least, not as myself. A part of me, perhaps my desire to live, stayed behind. I guess you could say I'm depressed. It isn't until now that I feel ready to tell anyone about what happened to us. We went through something so unfathomable that it's difficult for me to put it into words. But I'll do my best. Back when it happened, almost two years ago, my best friend and I were both studying anthropology in France, and we were both avid cave explorers. During summer break, we had explored the most famous cave systems in France and studied all the well-known cave paintings and remains from the Neolithic era. We both lived for this, so it was a no-brainer for both of us to spend our summer break doing the same kind of thing as we did at the university. We had followed established guidelines, but the last week before we returned to our university town, we decided to explore Rigordo in search of caves that hadn't been discovered yet. This was a bit irresponsible, since none of us were experienced enough for such an undertaking, but we were both thrill-seekers, and even though we didn't believe we would find anything, the search itself was exciting enough for us to keep going. However, we did find something. It was Alex who saw it at first. He yelled at me from where he was doing his business. Hey, Lester, come check this out. What is it? You want me to see a pee? I laughed at the thought of it. No, man, I think I found something. I got up from the rock I was sitting on and walked over to him. So, what did you find? Look, look at the boulder next to the cliff. Do you see it? I did see it. There was a small entrance behind it. No way, I said. But then I collected myself so that I wouldn't get too excited. Do you think it's possible? I mean, do you think it might lead to a larger cave? I don't know. There's only one way to find out, right? I guess, I said, feeling my heart rate increase. It could be nothing. I find it hard to believe that no one would have discovered a cave system in this area. We aren't that far away from the main road. It's so small. It's easy to imagine it could have been missed. Anyway, shut up and help me move this boulder. We had to use all of our strength and some of our equipment to push it aside. We crouched down and looked inside the entrance. I expected it to be nothing more than a small recess, but it was deep. Hello? Alex yelled into the hole in the cliff, and the echo slowly faded away somewhere far inside the bedrock. We debated what to do next, but the excitement in our voices made it clear we had already decided. The responsible thing to do would have been to report our findings and let professionals map out the cave, but we weren't going to just hand over a finding like this to someone else. Instead, we put on our gear. We crawled our way inside of the cave. Had we been just a tad bit bigger, we would have never fit. That's how small the opening was. I didn't suffer from claustrophobia. If I did, I wouldn't have been a cave explorer. But I didn't enjoy small passages like this. 
the thought of getting stuck still made me cringe. I had read enough horror stories about cave explorers getting killed that way to do my best to avoid crawl spaces, but in this case, I made an exception. Alex went in first, and I followed close behind him. A few meters in, a cold wind reached us. How you feeling this? Alex asked as he pushed his body through the small cave. Well, that's a cross breeze. Good, I said with some relief in my voice. That means there's an opening somewhere further ahead. The cold air coming from inside the cave smelled fresh. It was exactly what we needed after having spent the entire day under the scolding heat outside. A short while later, however, we began to freeze. I asked Alex if he knew how it could be so cold. It seemed way too cold to be explained by the airflow, but he was as clueless as me. Is it getting tighter or wider? I, I can't tell. I'm not sure either, Alex said. We kept going. My body ached. In some places, it was so narrow that I thought I would have to break my ribs to get through. The cave went upward, forcing us to climb. And then it went down until it turned sharply and continued to the south. The total absence of light except for our headlights felt suffocating. We came across a pitch, a steep section, that we had to use our ropes to get down. We had never tried cave diving before, and I felt really stupid doing it now, given how risky it was. A few more dangerous squeezes followed. The dust on the ground kept getting into my mouth. By now, I was exhausted. I think we should turn back. I'm getting too tired and frankly I'm starting to worry a little bit. We've been here for more than an hour. Perhaps we should try again tomorrow. Don't give up, Lesta, Alex said. It will be extremely difficult to go back the way we came. There's no way to turn around. Our best shot is to keep going and try to find the other opening. I could hear fear in his otherwise confident voice. Something that scared me just as much as our predicament. Just moments later, Alex spoke again. There's an opening ahead. It leads to a larger room. It, just a few more meters. I had to push Alex to press him through the opening. And as soon as he was out, he pulled me out. The room was big enough for us to stand in. It was only illuminated by our flashlights and headlights. Looking back at the hole we just came out of, it was clear that it was too small for us to enter. Squeezing yourself out of a tiny hole is one thing, and crawling inside of it another. Realizing this, my heart almost stopped. If the hole that let the cold air in was too small as well, if there was such a hole at all, we would die in here. I pointed my flashlight at Alex's face. His frosty, agitated breath and told me he was just as terrified as I was. Slowly, we tracked the walls with our flashlights. And to our relief, there was a second opening big enough for us to enter. Before I had time to cool down, something inside of the opening caught my eye. It was a skeleton, covered in some dark clothes. The lower part of his body was still inside the hole meaning he or she must have died trying to crawl out of it and gotten stuck. Shit, Lester, Alex said. It's good news, I said with a shaky voice. It means we're gonna get out. We sat down next to the remains, first to examine it and then to move it so that we could enter the small opening. The skull was lined face down, but based on the color of the bones, we immediately saw that this skeleton wasn't prehistoric. There was no soft tissue left, but as far as skeletons go, it looked rather fresh. Alex reached for the skull and carefully picked it up and held it in front of us. Give me some light, he said. I shone my flashlight on the face of the skull. It almost looked like it was smiling at us, 
a big, horrific grin. Put it away, I said. Wait, look at it. There's something. What? I asked in a whisper. Can't you see it? I was too stressed to see anything particular with it. It's surprisingly elongated. He turned the skull around. The back of its head is massive. And look at the top. Not very globular, you see. I began to see what he was talking about. But my mind didn't grasp what he was trying to tell me. So... I said. He turned the skull around so that the face was staring at us again. Look at his facial structures. Very pronounced. What are you trying to say? Its eyebrows are heavy. Look, Lester, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I think we're looking at the skull of a Neanderthal. That is crazy, I said, although I could clearly see the similarity from the skulls we had been studying in class. Look at the bones. It must have died at least within this century. I know, and yet this is clearly the skull of a Neanderthal. I mean, I know Neanderthal DNA in humans can affect the shape of the skull, but this is something else. Do you think the environment in the cave could have helped preserve the bones as well? I don't know. That would be pretty crazy as well, but I can't think of any explanation right now that wouldn't be completely bonkers. With a mixture of fear, confusion, and excitement, we decided to carefully move the remains away from the opening and leave the cave so that we could report our findings to the university. This passage was larger and we could make our way through it with ease. The worry disappeared from our voices as we crawled, and the excitement over what we had found took over. We did fear what the faculty would say about our amateurish expedition, but surely our discovery would compensate for our foolishness to some degree. We saw the light at the end of the cave, but strangely enough, it was cold. Alex got out first. Something is wrong, he said as I exited the cave. I saw what he meant. There were patches of snow in the grass. This was in late August, and it had been one of the warmest summers in recent memory. Dumbfounded, we looked around, trying to figure out what was going on. In front of us, there was a set of large boulders obscuring the view. We slowly walked past them and entered the forest. It seemed thicker than before. How much time did we spend in that cave? Alex asked, trying to make it sound like a joke, although he was obviously frightened. It's winter, or I mean, it's early spring at least. I looked up at the sun, it filtered behind a cover of clouds. The sun is where it's supposed to be. Whatever's going on, this is the same day. I reached for my phone. The time and date were as expected, but there was no reception or internet connection. We tried to walk around the cliff we had come out of in an attempt to find our camp, but on the other side, there was nothing to be found. The disorientation I felt trying to comprehend what was happening almost gave me a panic attack, but there wasn't any time to panic. A gunshot echoed through the forest. Two more followed. We decided to walk towards the sounds in the hopes to find someone to talk to. However, we moved slowly so that we would see them before they saw us. We came to a small hill. The sounds of voices came from the other side of it, but we couldn't hear what they were saying. We climbed up on the hill, lay down on top of it, and peeked down. On the ground beneath us, there was a large dead animal covered in thick fur. That's... Alex began. That's a mammoth, I continued. A group of people holding rifles 
that stood around the dead animal. All four of them were smoking, as far as I could see. They were covered in black clothes, similar to the ones we had found in the cave, and they all had hoods on them, which made it difficult to see their faces. They didn't speak any language we had ever heard before. It reminded us of a Khoisan language, but instead of the clicking sounds for those languages, it sounded like knocking sounds coming from the bottom of their throats. Both Alex and I had the same impossible thought, that they belonged to the same species as the individual we had found in the cave. One of them blew a whistle. It didn't make any sound that we could hear, but a minute later, four large animals came out of the woods. What are those? I whispered. They were big as grizzly bears, but had wolf-like faces. Some of them began barking. Hi. I think that dogs, Alex said. Have you ever seen dogs like that before? Look around you, Lester. Alex paused, as to think of the best way to explain it to my frantic mind. Don't you get it? I know it's fucking insane, but just consider what all of this is pointing to. Those people aren't humans, man. What are you on about? I said, trying to deny his conclusion to the bitter end. Are you really saying they had, have a language and going by the way they're moving their hands, parts of it are sign language? Alex was way ahead of me already. Are you suggesting we've traveled back to the Neolithic age? No, no, they have guns. As you said, this is the same day. It's just... just not the same Earth. I don't think Homo sapiens led them to extinction here. This is incredibly fascinating, Lester. I can't believe it. It feels like I'm dreaming, but you're seeing the same thing, right? I mean, I'm not lying in that cave slowly dying from carbon monoxide poisoning, am I? No, uh, I'm, I'm seeing it too. Well, look at them. They domesticated the dog, but they bred them into something different than we did. And look, they didn't exterminate the megafauna. That points to a smaller population like we always suspected. I still didn't know what to think, but I began to entertain the idea. It could explain the weather as well, I said while I watched how one of the presumed Neanderthals petted one of the huge dogs. A smaller population of hominids 40,000 years ago would have meant a much smaller amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and something growled behind us, and then it barked. Our blood ran cold. I looked behind. One of the large hounds had found us. Lester, Alex whispered as our eyes met. The beast charged at us. We had no choice but to run down from the hill, right into the arms of the cloaked men. They gathered around us, pointing their rifles at us. They were huge, much larger than a typical man, or rather, than a human. Their knocking sounds, coming from deep inside their throats, was mixed in with deep sounds that didn't resemble any language I had ever heard. From what I could tell by their hand movements and agitation in their voices, they seemed just as distressed as Alex and I. Their faces were shadowed by their hoods, but I could still see that they had the typical Neanderthal facial structures. My thoughts, still having trouble accepting what was happening, what will they do? I heard myself ask. As soon as I opened my mouth, one of the Neanderthals yelled something at us. Aluska, Aluska. We both interpreted it as something similar to hands up and fell on our knees and raised our hands. It all depends on what happened to Homo sapiens in this world, Alex whispered. If they see our species as mortal enemies, we might be doomed. But if we died out thousands of years ago, they'll probably want to keep us alive. The man that had yelled lit what looked like a mixture between a cigarette and a cigar with a large match. 
I tried to assess their level of technology. The rifles, clearly made for hunting, didn't have scopes, only iron sights. My first thought was that this indicated a lower technological level than the one we had at home. But then I realized that it might rather be a result of their larger eyes and areas of the brain devoted to vision. Maybe they simply didn't need scopes because of their superior sight. They talked for some time, and then one of them went away for a while and came back with some ropes that they used to tie our hands behind our backs. They didn't intend on killing us. Not right away, anyway. They led us away, seemingly abandoning the animal that they had just killed. Maybe finding us was more valuable to them. They've invented the combustion engine, Alex exclaimed. He was right. A vehicle stood on a dirt road in front of us. It had eight wheels, six at the back and two in the front, and resembled a diesel locomotive more than a truck. It was completely black, just like their clothes. They opened the back doors and pushed us inside the storage space. There was a smell of dead animals and gasoline. We were placed next to each other on a bench attached to the wall, and two of the Neanderthals sat down right in front of us, looking at us constantly. The only light came from two small windows on the back door. The truck began to move. I wonder what they'll think about our cell phones, Alex said. The Neanderthals each lit one of those big cigarettes, and the glow from them lit up their strong faces. One of them had green eyes. They're smoking a lot, Alex whispered. Research shows that Neanderthal DNA may account for nicotine addiction. Yeah, and depression. You think they're depressed? Alex smiled, but the fear in his eyes didn't go away. We couldn't see anything outside, except that the sun was setting, but we felt the bumps in the road as the trucks drove forward at a pretty high speed. After some time, the road became smooth, had we reached a highway? It was hard to tell. We couldn't hear any other vehicles outside. Wherever we were going, it was far away. We didn't stop until three or four hours later. It must have been in the middle of the night, but we didn't get to see the night sky. When the back doors were opened, we stepped out inside of a large garage. There were a lot of black vehicles parked under the high ceilings, but none of them looked like the ones we had come with. These vehicles were smaller, like cars, all black. I guessed that this place wasn't where they usually went. The architecture was similar to Soviet-era brutalism and was as devoid of colors as everything else in this place. After what we had already seen, I wasn't surprised to discover that they had mastered electricity, but they didn't use fluorescent lights as in a modern garage, but rather pretty dim, but still large lamps hanging from the ceiling. Again, I came to think of their better vision. One of the hunters used a radio attached to the dashboard of the truck. After half an hour or so, a small door opened, the sound of it echoing through the garage. Three people, a bit smaller, walked out of it. The group that had captured us pushed us in our backs so that we would straighten them. This seemed to be important to them, as they did it to themselves as well. The new people didn't wear the same clothes as our capturers. They still covered their faces, not with hoods, but with thin black veils. As they got closer to us, I could tell that they were women. They looked at Alex and I, obviously fascinated. One of them picked up what looked like a walkie-talkie, and said something to it without taking her eyes off of us. And carefully, her colleagues reached out and knocked on my helmet that I was still wearing. We must have looked completely alien to them in our colorful gear and equipment. Although the women were smaller than the men, they were still much stronger than us. One of them led the men to another door, perhaps for questioning, and the other two, holding what looked like electric batons, and took me and Alex back to the door they had exited. We stepped into an elevator. 
Unlike the elevators we were used to, this one was merely a platform. My clothes scraped against the concrete walls of the shaft as we went up. Looking up, I could tell the building was tall. One of the women controlled the elevator with a lever, rather than just pressing a button. It was all clunky and cumbersome, but remarkably effective. They took us to a small room, similar to an interrogation room, and had us sit down in two large chairs. A commotion took place outside of the room, and people were running back and forth, talking to each other and into their radios. This scenario was nothing they had planned for. Different women entered the room from time to time. Some of them tried to talk to us. Some just wanted to take a look. We sat in this room for hours. After that, two male guards took us to another room. It looked like a locker room that had been cleared out for our sake. They seized our belongings. Alex took his helmet off and gave it to the woman who had knocked on it. And then he carefully turned on the headlight to show her how it worked. They didn't seem too surprised by it. Most likely they had similar devices. The colorful plastic interested them much more, which I took as a sign that their technological level was maybe a hundred or fifty years behind ours. Plastic, Alex said, without being understood. They stripped off our clothes and pointed at a couple of showers in the middle of the room. We placed ourselves there, and one of the guards turned on the water. It was too cold, but overall, they didn't seem to want to cause us any pain. After the shower, we were given a pair of yellow overalls to wear. In the next room, this one looked like a classroom, we were brought to the desk at the front. A group of women, wearing protective masks, had put our smartphones on the desk. Alex took his phone and unlocked it. This was the first time these people would see our level of technology. If they see this, he said to me, if they see how advanced we are compared to them, they'll let us live. He tried to be as pedagogical as he could, showing them the display as he pressed on the different apps. Of course, there wasn't any internet connection, so he couldn't show them anything online. But their eyes were transfixed on the colorful display. The males, who didn't seem to be allowed to do anything else but stand guard, peeked down at the display in wonder. Alex smiled at the attention, almost as if he was proud. But I felt severely uneasy. He opened his gallery and showed them a video he had taken at a large climate change protest he had attended in New York. The Neanderthal's fascination turned into worry as they watched the skyscrapers and the hundreds of thousands of people marching down the streets. After this, one of the women looked at us suspiciously as she picked up a phone on the wall and called someone. After some deliberation, two women with batons led us into the elevator again. This time, we stopped at the last floor, maybe 200 meters above the surface. They took us through a corridor with what looked like office doors to the side. To my disappointment, there were no windows. A few other women stepped out of their offices and looked at us as we passed, equally mesmerized as they were scared. At the end of the hallway... There was a door that led into a room of greater importance than the other rooms. There was some text next to the door. I couldn't tell if the characters were phonetic or logographic, but at least they didn't look like hieroglyphs. One of the women pressed a button in the middle of the door. It didn't make any sound, but was probably some sort of doorbell. While we waited for the door to open, a faint alarm could be heard from somewhere nearby probably outside. And one minute later, the building began to shake a little. I looked at Alex, who looked back at me, but it didn't seem to phase the Neanderthals. The door opened automatically. We were pushed inside the room. It was big, just like everything else. A black carpet, the skin of some animal, covered the floor and a heavy desk stood in front of us. 
Behind it, another woman was sitting. Unlike the others, she didn't cover her face. Her hair was red and her eyes were blue. She wore something similar to a jumpsuit. Not black, but light gray. She inhaled the smoke of a wooden pipe, rather than from one of those cigarettes. And as she exhaled, I could smell that she was smoking a mix of tobacco and marijuana. Behind her, there was a large window, but nothing but darkness could be seen outside. There were no electric lights, which meant we weren't in a city. Perhaps they didn't even have cities. The woman who brought us here placed her batons at the fold of our knees, giving us an electric shock so that we fell in front of the massive desk. Alex yelled out in pain, but didn't look as scared as I was. My body trembled with fear. The woman sitting behind the desk got up from her chair and walked over to us. They spoke over our heads while we remained silent. They wouldn't understand us anyway. Ah, uh, they won't harm us. We're too valuable for them, Alex said. I don't want to be locked up in a laboratory. We'll find a way, Alex began but was interrupted by the woman that seemed to be in charge. She gestured toward us in a way that made it clear she wanted us to stand up. Alex got up, but for some reason, I couldn't move. One of the women grabbed my arm and more or less lifted me up on my feet in one swift moment. Their commander, or whatever she was to them, said something. The context didn't allow us to figure out what it was, other than maybe a question. She led us to one of the walls, between two bookshelves, filled with what looked like screw-bound books. There was a world map. At first glance, it didn't look like Earth. Alex took a hesitant step forward, and when the woman didn't seem to mind, I did too. I don't get it. I said, way too stressed to think clearly. The woman said something to us again, but this time, it sounded more like a command. She probably wanted to know where we came from. Alex put his finger on the map. This is Africa, he said. It wasn't until he said it that I saw it. The first map had a completely different orientation. Firstly, it was a south up map meaning upside down from our perspective. Secondly, it was a little bit off-center, putting Central Europe right in the middle. And thirdly, the size of the land masses were displayed a bit differently. Since we couldn't explain where we came from, Alex tried to give the woman the location of our species' origin instead. And by the look of her face, she didn't seem to believe us. Still, she let us study the map while she studied us. Look, Alex said, there are no borders. They don't have countries. But what about these, these pictograms? Small black skulls, displayed from the side, were spread out all over the map. Dotted circles of different sizes surrounded them. Are they some kind of dead zones? You're anthropomorphizing. I don't think they symbolize death here, but rather themselves. And maybe they're cities or, or some kind of city-states. And look there. He pointed at what would have been Russia in our world. Those skulls are red and... Wow, they're different, you see? What does it mean? Are you suggesting? I asked. Denisovans. It makes sense if you think about it. With a smaller population, the Neanderthals never drove the other hominid species to extinction. This is unreal. Alex's fascination overshadowed all of his fear. Look, there's a red line going alongside the Ural Mountains, and behind it, the Denisovans live. All the way to Australia. But look here. Alex said without listening to me. He placed his finger on Indonesia. This blue region. The skulls are different too. Can you see it? 
Homo floresiensis, I whispered. You bet. The black skulls, the Neanderthals, dominated Europe, Africa, and most of the New World, while the Denisovans seemed to rule Asia and some parts of the west side of South America, together with the small area dominated by Homo floresiensis. The ice caps were, as expected, larger than in our world, but it didn't seem to prevent the Neanderthals from living close to the North Pole. They even had cities in Greenland, although their total amount of cities was smaller than the amount in most countries in our world. The woman, watching us carefully while we inspected the map, and took a puff of her pipe and blew the smoke in our faces. Then she returned to her desk and picked up what looked like a mouthpiece and made a call with the device it was connected to. She spoke aggressively to the person at the other end of the call. The alarm from outside that we had heard earlier, it sounded like a mechanical Swedish cow horn, came back again. This time it sounded louder, probably because we stood so close to a window. The woman didn't seem to care about it, but she raised her voice a little to compensate for the noise. Some electric lights turned on outside, but they didn't reveal much. About a minute or two later, huge flames erupted a couple of hundred meters away, and a few seconds later, a rumble reached us. A rocket! Alex exclaimed. 